every Wheel of Time fan knows exactly how descriptive Robert Jordan's writing is. As someone with a professional chef's background, I was always really interested in all of his writing about food. So I thought it would be fun to recreate recipes as I came across them in the books. I started this massive reread. And as I come across something, I make a recipe to go along with it. So grab your apron and follow me and we will make Tam's stew. Hi everyone, welcome to the Wheel of Time community show. I'm your host, Kitty. Before we get started, of course, like this video and hit subscribe to our channel. Today, we are going to be making Tam's stew. We come across this stew in The Eye of the World, chapter five, Winter Night. It's when Rand and Tam are coming home from Emmons Field and Rand has to do chores for about three pages while Tam makes the stew. So the description of the stew is just stew. There's no specific ingredients mentioned. It's just Tam creating dinner. And knowing what we know about the characters and their surroundings, we can potentially assume that it is just going to be a pot over the fire that just keeps getting added to and added to day after day. So it can get thicker and richer and more flavors built up over time. Now, they're probably going to use lamb because they're surrounded by sheep. I am not surrounded by sheep. So I used beef because I have grocery stores. If you want to use lamb, that's great. But for ease, I am going to use beef. Now for the vegetables. In the eye of the world, winter has continued for way too long. They're going to use only what is left at the very end of winter, which is going to be from the root cellar. So we're going to need potatoes, onions, things that can last for a very long time. Fresh stuff like celery or something fine like fresh herbs not going to really make it through the winter that never ends. However, this is your stew to make. So if you want to change it for dietary reasons or personal preferences, please do so. We will put some extra notes in the recipe, which will be in the show notes below. And you can also find it on dragomat.com. Before we jump into the recipe itself, here are the ingredients you'll need. Feel free to take a screenshot of them right here, or you can download the full printer-friendly recipe from dragomount.com. So to make this, you'll need two pounds of boneless beef short ribs, chuck or lamb, trimmed and cut into one inch chunks, kosher salt and freshly ground pepper, two tablespoons canola oil, two medium carrots, peeled, split in half and sliced into half inch chunks, one large russet potato, peeled, half inch dice, one large yellow onion, finely diced, one teaspoon soy sauce, two medium garlic cloves, grated, finely diced, or with a garlic press, one tablespoon tomato paste, one quart low sodium chicken broth, one 14.4 ounce can of whole peeled tomatoes, drained and roughly chopped, one cup pearl barley, not quick cook or instant, two bay leaves, and three to four large kale leaves, loosely torn, stem removed. All right, let's get started on this amazing stew that's actually pretty simple. We're gonna start with those rustic root vegetables. The carrot, peel it first, of course. Technically, you can eat the peel, but I wouldn't. Now, the size of your carrot doesn't matter that much. In the end, you just want a decent amount, so cut off the ends. and then split your carrot in half. This could be a little tricky because sometimes they're really woody depending on how old they are. But there we go. And what I like to do is turn one side the other way so that it makes a nice rectangle. And a weird little trick, if the ends are really, really a lot fatter than the skinny end, you can just partially cut down like so, so that when you chop, you now have more even pieces. I'm going for about a half inch, about, not measuring it, it's a rustic stew. Onto the onion, normal, just yellow, 
not a sweet, not a red, just basic yellow onion. Cut off your ends. Cut it in half. And then peel. If you, like me, didn't cut the root end off enough, then <clears throat> go back over it because you want to make sure everything is free enough so that you can just easily peel off the first outer layer. You can try to get just the skin, but I usually make a mess, so I go with the whole full outer layer of the onion. Doesn't have to be perfect. Same for the other side. Now comes the fun part. Actually not so fun, onions make me cry, so I try to do this quickly but safely. I cut onions differently than a lot of people, but everyone has their own way. This is not technically the correct way, but I didn't go to chef school, so it's okay. And as I go, I'm gonna put some in the bowl and then just keep going. I'm doing a fine dice so the onions melt down more. If you like bigger chunks of onion, feel free. It's a stew, not a pastry, so it doesn't have to be precise. All right, starting to cry. Cool, all right, gonna get through this. a lot of onion. Onions are delicious and if you don't think so you are wrong. Not naming any names. Guys it's the onions it's not you it's the onions. Well maybe it's some of you but not the majority. On to the humble potato. Now, as soon as you cut these, they are going to start to oxidize and turn a little bit brown or yellow. So that is normal. I am using russet potatoes and because of that, I did peel them. Now russets take a longer time to cook as well, but they break down. But I'm using that breakdown of the potatoes to thicken the stew because I'm not using any flour or cornstarch or anything that they might not have had to thicken the stew. I'm guessing it's the type of stew pot that just stays over the fire for days and days and days and they just keep adding to it so it would naturally thicken over time. I'm going to go for, I don't know, half an inch cubes. Perhaps, slabs, turn it over. You turn them into sticks. Then you just cube them. And if your knife is not long enough, like mine isn't, because I use a, I believe this is an eight inch chef's knife because 10 inches is just too big for me. Some people like it, but I don't. Now, you don't have to use a russet potato. However, if you wanna use something like a new potato or a red potato, you are not gonna get the same thickening power from them because they don't break down the same way and they don't really really starch the same way. And now to cut the short rib. Obviously raw meat. So after you cut on this surface, you have to wash it, but we're doing about one inch sections. So with these, I'm just gonna cut them in half. I got boneless short ribs. Uh, bone in short ribs are always available. They are usually cheaper, but they're harder to cut because of the bone and there is silver skin in them. So I like to pay a little extra to do a little less work. And these are very fatty, which I wanted, but if you want something less hard to cut, you could go with chuck. Uh, the reason we're going with beef is it's more widely available than lamb. In the books, they would probably be doing sheep or lamb and it would be cured, either salt cured or uh, smoked because they did have a smoke shed. But for us these days, we're not used to eating preserved meat within a stew or a soup or as an entree instead of a charcuterie platter. 
We've got everything prepped, sliced, measured, so that's all ready to go. So now it's time for the garlic, soy sauce, and the tomato paste. Garlic, you can just chop it really, really fine. It's a lot easier if you have a garlic press or a microplane. Otherwise, just have at it with a knife. Then we also have the tomato paste. And in the world of the Wheel of Time, I was trying to figure out how to justify something like tomato paste. Now, we know that they've got a curing shed and they've got pickles. So some assumptions can be made about canning or jarring and reducing and Otherwise, I think we can justify tomato paste as well as soy sauce. They would probably have some sort of concentrated, flavorful cooking liquid just used for every day. So I put all three of those together onto seasoning the meat. After your meat has been cut, it's time to season it. And I, uh, I like to use gloves because I don't like to get meat bits under my nails, but that's me. You can also use a fork or a spoon or a small child, whatever you have lying around. It's just simple salt and pepper, which I already have together. I'm just gonna sprinkle a little bit on top of my cut and then dump this bowl into a bigger bowl so I can stir a lot easier. Sprinkle in some more. Now, some people love really heavily seasoned some people like lightly seasoned. This is your stew. You season it the way you want to. I like a lot of seasoning. So just really get in there. Make sure each cube has got some sort of seasoning on it. And now with the meat, you'll notice this has a lot of fat and it has a lot of connective tissue. So it's not going to be like a ribeye or a filet mignon or a New York strip. This is going to be like the long term cooking. It takes a lot of time to break it down. So even if we cook this really quickly and it gets all brown and beautiful on the outside, it's still going to be very tough. That's why it needs the long cooking process to break down the connective tissues to release all the collagen and the good unctuous stuff, which is also why you don't want to use a quick cooking steak. So save your ribeyes, your New York strips, your tenderloins for, you know, the grill or something quick. Let's start cooking the stew. Very, very important thing that I uh, <clears throat> might have learned the hard way is that if you have a power burner that can do like a quick boil or something that has like a bigger flame or is more powerful than your other burners, you don't want to use that for a long-term cooking for anything because it'll overcook things and then you will be very sad. So I've heard. We are going to heat the canola oil just until it gets really hot and smoking essentially. And you want to make sure to use a high heat oil. So olive oil will burn really quickly. So canola, vegetable, something that can just hold and handle the high heat. Once the oil is shimmering, you know it's hot enough, time for the meat. Just dump it in and don't move it. Okay, I lied. You can move it just to spread it to the bottom to make sure it's covered. But now, just let it sear for about five minutes. So the reason to leave the meat alone is so it can develop a crust, like a really deep, dark crust on one side, which is where a lot of the flavor comes from. And it's gonna stick to the bottom of the pot, which we're gonna scrape off later when we add the stock. And that just, you know, it's just building layers of flavor. Let's check on it. Okay, the meat is done browning, so we're actually just gonna take it out and put it in the bowl that it was in. It's okay that it was a raw bowl because it's still gonna continue to cook. You just need to make room for the vegetables to brown. So there's a lot of good juices and flavors now in this Dutch oven. We're just gonna dump our onions and our carrots in. Just leave them for about four or five minutes to brown and to get some more caramelization on the bottom. 
All right, our vegetables are nice and relaxed and soft now, and they've soaked up a lot of that extra liquid. So now it's time to add our aromatic tomato paste, soy sauce, and garlic. I'm just gonna make a spot in the pan for it and drop it right in. And then stir really quickly because garlic can burn, maybe like 30 seconds. Ooh, but it smells so good as it cooks. All right, it's been about 30 seconds. Time to pour in the stock. Ooh. All right, and make sure to scrape up any and all of the bits that are left on the bottom, if there are any, maybe along the sides. So use something that's flat. A lot of people use a wooden spoon. I use my handy dandy uh, flat spatula. All right, so now this is in. We're gonna add the beef back in. And our bay leaves. I'm gonna use two right now. Barley. Tomatoes. And potatoes. And we're gonna stir this, bring it to a boil. And after it boils, reduce it to a simmer. All right, as you can see, we are at a boil. So now all that's left to do is reduce it to the absolute lowest that your stove can go. Put the lid on and leave it a little bit cracked, just a tiny bit. It's gonna take about two hours for the beef and the barley and the potato to cook through, but stir it a couple of times and walk away. I just checked on the stew and it is smelling amazing. The barley's all plump and the potatoes are falling apart and the beef is, it's real good. So now it's time to just put in the dark leafy green vegetables if you want. I have kale. I don't know why, maybe because I live in LA, but nothing, nothing fancy. I'm literally just going to tear it. Now kale has a big stem part in the middle. I'm not a botanist. You don't want that, so you can just tear it off. That's all you want. And you're just gonna drop those in the pot and stir them in so that it wilts a little bit just before serving, only for maybe a couple of minutes. Then I could eat it right away, but this stew is even better the next day and the next day. So after I put in my kale, I'm gonna do a final check, add more salt and pepper if I want, which I will, and then put it into containers, let it cool down and put it in the fridge and have it for dinner tomorrow. And here we are, the finished product, Tam's Stew. Oof. So this smells so good. It's rich, it's meaty. This barley has just soaked up all that goodness. And this is the thickness I like it. I like it really chunky, but if you like it thinner, make it a soup, just add more stock. You can do different vegetables, remove things, add things. This is just the bare bones. And it's, you will see, I will put all these notes in the recipe that we will have below. And as always, if you make this, please tag us, let us know with Dragon Mount. Until next time, my name is Kitty. Stay hungry out there. Thanks for sticking around to the end. As always, subscribe, click the thumbs up, leave a comment. You know we like the comments, especially the positive ones. If you got a friend that likes the Wheel of Time, tell them about our show. Tell them about DragonMount.com. I want to give a special thanks to our sponsor, Tor Books, as well as all of our Patreon supporters. If you want to learn more about how our show gets made, maybe get some additional insights into the Wheel of Time, become a Patreon supporter. We have grand plans for the show, and all of your contributions will go a long way to making them happen. And uh, make sure to follow DragonMount on all the social media. Thanks. Peace.